Hey everyone, I'm Michael Short. Come on, let's go outdoors. Did you know that Wampus Creek is home to one of the most uh, impressive populations of Athabasca rainbow trout. In fact, the numbers are so strong there because fishing hasn't been allowed since the 1960s, that biologists use it as a benchmark to other Athabasca rainbow trout populations in other locations along the eastern slopes. Uh, there's only three spots in basically in Western Canada where we're going to find native Athabasca rainbows. This is the only place in Alberta, upper Athabasca watershed. Otherwise, we'd have to go into the Upper Peace or Liard uh, watersheds in Upper British Columbia. The Athabasca rainbow trout is listed in Alberta as threatened. However, under the Federal Species at Risk Act, these trout are classified as endangered. No matter what label we attach to this fish, it's imperative to some that it remains part of our ecosystem. Because those species have a place in the ecosystem that they have for a role. Their, their resiliency, their ability to adapt plays an important role in that larger ecosystem. Losing that species uh, can have big consequences as a result of that. So um, is it worth that investment and is it hard work? Absolutely, I think in both cases, Mike. So just what are the challenges facing this fish? Pointing the finger at industry is a frequent tactic, so it's somewhat surprising to hear active logging is taking place on the doorstep of the Athabasca rainbow trout habitat. Uh, but in that entire area, in the upper McLeod system, uh, for example, Wampus Creek has been close to fishing for, what, 50, 60 years now, and, and we see, we're still seeing high densities, even though we're seeing forestry in there. Am I saying forestry is good for fish? Probably not, but what I'm saying is it's, it's not one thing. We're not pointing the finger at pulling trees down. We're not pointing the fingers at just angling. It's what happens is when we have a, a fishery that's in at, at a higher risk or lower density, a lower number within the watershed, once we put more than one or two threats on it, it's really, really hard to recover. And if we put two or three or four, that's when we start to see declines. And so in the last few years here, identifying these as endangered fish, uh, moving towards recovering them and preventing the, the fu future or continual decline has been a really good step towards uh, keeping Athabasca rainbows on the landscape. So the question is, when will we know that we have a sustainable population of Athabasca rainbows? See, what we do is we take a reference population like a Wampus Creek and that is our, our upper number. And so anything less than 50% of that would be considered higher risk. So in between the Wampus Creek, so 75% of the fish at Wampus Creek, that would be a really good density of fish. 50% uh, of that would be kind of a moderate density. So we strive for most of our fisheries in Alberta to kind of have that moderate density. So not really, really high densities because people like to fish and in some places we even like to eat, like we're able to eat fish. But if we could get to that moderate density with Athabasca rainbows, I think Athabasca rainbows will be around for a long, long time. So one of the tools biologists are using is electrofishing. This helps them determine the number of Athabasca rainbow in a given section of the river. And once they get a population number that they've pulled out, that allows them to assess the risk to the fish in this area. So Mike, what would be your advice to anglers uh, fishing waters where Athabasca rainbow are known to, to live? Uh, well, if you're fishing in waters with Athabasca rainbows, I, I would just say that uh, handle the fish quickly and safely. Keep it in the water if you can. Um, actively fish your line so that the fish doesn't take a deep. And, uh, and enjoy your day catching rainbows. Do you, do you envision a day where they're their range can increase? Absolutely, I, I envision that all the time. Uh, working with genetics and, and creeks like Wampus Creek, uh, we're hoping that one day that we can get those pure genetics, uh, secure them and potentially expand range or recover streams that uh, have lost rainbows or have hybrids in them. Unlike other rainbows, Athabasca rainbows retain their par marks as adults Although the Athabasca rainbow trout requires genetic analysis to be accurately identified 
as pure Athabascans. You got the par marks. This is probably an adult fish, or very close to it, and it's still retaining the juvenile par marks. What marks? So these gray ovals here. Oh, okay. These are what you see typically on a, uh, a juvenile salmonid fish. They, they're kind of like camouflage, so they could hide inside the in the gravel and stuff. But at the Bascaribos, because they re they're such they're so small, even as adults, they retain these par marks throughout adulthood. Okay. Uh, some of them lose them. Some of them, a lot of them retain them, like upwards to 30 centimeters. One of the things that became apparent during the sampling of this stream was the number of brook trout, which is an issue. The interesting thing about brook trout with and rainbows is that brook trout mature a lot faster. So they get to an adult stage, they grow faster. Um, they, they stay in the gravel all winter because they're a char species. And so when they pop out of the gravel early in the spring, whereas Athabasca rainbows don't spawn until June. So then they pop out a little bit later in the summer. So even as fry, brook trout come out as, I, I like to call them the big bullies, right? So they're, they're a little bit bigger, they're a little bit more aggressive. So they could fight for food. Uh, one of the things we got to worry about in these streams too is fighting for space, right? So there's only so much space and food in each creek. And if uh, one species has a leg up on the other one, they could potentially outcompete them in that area. Despite the challenges this special trout faces, there is optimism for its future. Well, you know me, Mike, I'm always optimistic about this. Otherwise I wouldn't be doing this, but uh, my optimism now is the cool thing is we ha I think we have a more concerted effort in Alberta now, uh, working together with the three species plan we're working towards, so bull trout, uh, west slopes, and Athabasca rainbows. The thing is, is what we're recognizing is all fish need the same thing. And for the most part, they're, they're all dealing with the same threat. So we have uh, mortality as a threat, so that could be natural mortality, that could be mortality from angling, it could be mortality uh, from sedimentation, um, we also have threats such as fragmentation, so that could be something like um, a road that has a culvert that's hanging and fish can't get up. So as you've seen, those, the Athabasca rainbows that we have, a 14 centimeter fish, so something like this, that's an adult Athabasca rainbow. That is a spawning fish. Compared to their cousins on the coast, they're spawning and they're jumping up waterfalls. These little fish can't do that. So. I, I guess the short answer is I'm, I'm optimistic in that we're all looking in the east slopes at pretty much every some wanted right now. And the scary thing is, is three of them, bull trout, west slopes and rainbows are all considered at high risk in Alberta. So. so just what has to happen for sustainable trout numbers to be realized? And a lot of sustainability means we've got resilience to, to aspects that are going to happen on our land base. That's, that's a land base that has to coexist with uh, industrial activities. Uh, that could be forestry, that could be oil and gas. It can include angling. Uh, it can include being resilient to uh, what we're seeing with sometimes the broadening of invasive species across Alberta. And so if we can get to population levels, and not only in certain areas, but the expansion into habitat that was formerly Athabasca rainbow trout, uh, we can be resilient to things like climate change that happen that could impact Athabasca rainbow trout. I think that's those recovery signs, Michael. So we want to see numbers grow. We want to see uh, sizes uh, ranges increase everywhere from small to large and then we want to see that habitat expansion and part of that might be using things like restoration techniques having habitat restoration that we see at the basket rainbows like we caught here today uh, where we can maybe translocate those into habitat that is now suitable for that so I think if we can check those boxes off Mike we've done a lot of good work so first at the basket rainbow that I've caught <laughs> uh, I guess by other means but hey I'll take it that's really cool that is really cool. Amazing little fish. Let's hope they have a long future here in Alberta. So as you've heard, there are a lot of challenges facing Athabasca rainbow trout, plus the other uh, native trout species here in our province. But as I always do, I learned something hanging out with Mike Blackburn and Kate on Wilcox. I want to thank them for allowing me to tag along as they did some fishing, uh, electro fishing. And uh, hopefully you learned something about this uh, amazing species of fish that we have here in Alberta. Till next time, everyone, I'm Michael Short. Come on, let's go outdoors. <laughs>